Today, we're starting a brand new project to build an awesome 37 Ford like this. We're going to one of the best glass rod builders in the nation to pick up the rolling chassis for our new hot rod truck. That's all today here on Trucks. Welcome to Trucks. Obviously, we're not in the shop. We're up here at Legend Motors, Downs Design, to check out their facility. Now, these guys manufacture some of the finest fiberglass rods out there, and we thought it'd be pretty cool to give you a little tour. Now we're going to show you how they build these vehicles, every step of the process, but you may want to pay particular attention to the trucks. Because a 37 Ford, just like this one, is the start of our next trucks project. And when we're done with it, we're going to give it away, and it'll end up in one of your garages. In this 50,000 square foot facility, Downs has been making fiberglass molds of different car designs for 30 years, so they can then reproduce a huge variety of parts in a relatively short period of time. It starts with what they call a plug, taken from an original part. Then it's customized to give it the downs touch. And from there, molds are made from the plug, so reproductions can be made in the mold and lamination building. We talked with J.R. Singleton, a 20-year employee of Downs, who walked us through some of the process. The resin transfer system that we have, which um, you can have gel-coated surface on the inside of the part as well as the outside, there's a, a male mold and a female mold. Um, add vent tubes for the air to migrate through as you put the two molds together. Inside of the female side of the mold, you add a um, flexible glass called Rovacore. And you put the male side of the mold down into the female and um, close it down with um, bolts to seal the molds together. The resin transfer process leaves you with a part that has an inner panel as smooth as the outer, which is particularly nice when you're building a showpiece. Now this is the female side of the mold, and this is the male side. And just by looking at these molds, it's not hard to figure out why these cars look so straight right out of the molding process. These molds are perfect. The 67 mold for the Corvette we just finished is the most complex mold ever designed here at Downs. 26 sections we had to bolt together to reproduce that one car. Believe it or not, this is a Corvette body. It's already been molded and is getting extra layers of glass in key structural areas for added strength. Once the bodies are cured, the outer mold comes off and reveals a finished looking replica. But this is far from a finished body. It goes through a series of steps that includes removing the windshield slugs, trimming molding flash off the edges, and generally shaping things to spec before the body gets joined with floor sex. Now, not only do they pop out cool fiberglass street rods and muscle cars, but look, they make the cape for the Superman monster truck. How cool is that? Since everything is prototyped and designed ahead of time, Downs has jigs for all their frames that are assembled in the fabrication shop. Every frame is fully boxed for strength and a custom finished look, with suspension systems that are made to order from an amazing list of options that Downs offers, including air ride, coilovers, and Downs' own independent suspension. The body and the frame meet up for the first time at the fab shop which also serves as the R&D shop. And there's a lot more going on here than just street rods. When we get back, it's more from these creative hot rod builders and designers. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. We're at Legend Motors Downs Design, giving you guys a sneak peek at some of the cool stuff these guys got in the works, including this retrofit 67 vet body that'll sit on a late 70s Corvette frame. 
Yeah. Okay, it's looking a little like government work here, guys. Tell us what's going on. Well, we're in the middle of doing a changeover process here. Um, you've seen the 67 Corvette in the other building. We're actually going to make that 67 vet fit the newer style frame. Um, I'm not sure what years we're covering on the frames. It's like 63, 382. See that car we have set up over there is built on a newer chassis. Now what we're doing is we're designing a floor pan so you can mount it onto the old style. Yeah. Core that body, whether you got yeah. an Art Morrison chassis or just a regular old 72 chassis. Yeah. Okay, so when it's all said and done, this 67 body is going to be sitting on that 75 frame, right? Yes, sir, it is. Like I say, we'll get that floor pan modified, set down on there. And then from that point on, we'll have a new floor pan mold where we bolt it down to that body, bring on the body like this right out of the mold, and it'll snap on basically like a giant model car. We have all, I'm not, I'm not kidding, that's true. We have it all designed where it fits in, snaps in. We have peaks on the pan over there where it just snaps down like a model car. We'll glue it, continue on with the build, so and down the road we go. It's like a fiberglass automotive toupee. Yes, <laughs> something of that nature. <laughs> It was amazing to see all this R&D happening on classic muscle when Downs is really best known for the pre-war street rods. We actually caught up with Jamie Downs while he was building a prototype clay model interior of their 69 Camaro tribute car. Well, our company started back in 1980 with my father, Jim Downs, and uh, he had 25 years experience of building Corvettes, which are made out of fiberglass. And when he was tired of that business, um, he came across four or five molds that were for sale and thought he knew enough about fiberglass to make some street rod bodies and do it for a hobby. He uh, made a body out of each mold and back in 1980 went to the street rod nationals and set up in the swap meet area. And before he knew it, he was taking orders. He sold all of them and turned it into a business overnight. Now with the merger with Legend Motors, I've been given a good opportunity to branch off into some newer vintage classic cars like the Camaros, the Cuda, uh, the mid-year Corvette, 63 to 67 vets, and the 59 vet. Now the Tribute muscle cars are nice, but we're into trucks, and Jamie was the driving force behind the concept for our 37 Ford project truck. In 1999, I designed that pickup cab, and it's been a pretty big hit. We won Best New Product of the Year. Two years later, we did adapt a 40 nose to that pickup. I like the looks of the 37, even though there's quite a few of them out there. It seems like it's still popular, and it turns heads more than the 40s did. Legend Motors Downs design has got their roots deep in the past and their finger on the pulse of the future of this industry, fusing timeless designs, classic muscle, and honest street rod sense. Over the past 30 years, they've honed and refined the process of making replica cars, and from what we could see, they've got it down to a fine art. And this, well, this is our truck, a 37 Ford pickup replica that's already chock full of custom modifications like these Mini Cooper headlights, a one-piece hood, a chopped top. Plus, they made room for our 22-inch wide steamrollers out back. We got shaved door handles and a gel coat finish that rivals a lot of paint jobs we've seen. All in all, they've set us up with an incredible foundation to build on and make one very cool street rod pickup for one of you guys. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's get this thing on the trailer. You got it. So we loaded the 37 onto the trailer and headed home, itching to get started on this project. And let me tell you, along the way, this truck turned some heads. Everywhere we stopped, it was like a car show in the parking lot. That is awesome. What kind of wheels are those in the back? Those are Mickey Thompson's. Mickey Thompson. Yep. That's beautiful, though. That is absolutely cool. Black leather. No, no. I'm with, Burn yourself. I'm with you. I don't know. This is the then cool factor. Use Canada. <laughs> <laughs> those are brand new Mini Cooper headlights. Oh, so they refit the fenders to fit them. So you can aim them properly, you can see at night, and it's a cool custom look. It is cool. So no back seat for this nope, truck? Nope, not even. Very cool, man. Cool. That's cool. After the break, we'll come up with a plan for our new hot rod truck project. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Well, we finally made it back to the shop with our new project, HRT, which quite literally stands for Hot Rod Truck. 
And now that we got some great ideas and inspiration, here's what we're going to do. Well, this thing's going to need some motivation, and we could probably fit any engine we wanted to down in here. But this thing started out a Ford, but we're going to keep it that way. We're thinking a hopped up small block would be right at home. Now we saw lots of great ideas for lighting out on the show field, but Down's design has already got us a great head start with these fenders that accept modern Mini Cooper headlights. But for turn signals, we got all kinds of options. We could mount them into bumpers, we could use traditional style vintage lights, we can flush mount them into the fiberglass, but whatever we decide to do, we're going to walk you guys through it step by step. Now we've shown you these wheels and tires before, and we had to put them on something. 20 by 16 inch one piece aluminum wheels wrapped in 33 by 22 inch wide rubber. Now with a built small block to launch it and bare brakes all around to stop it, well these rollers ought to be right at home on this truck. Now this is a rolling chassis, but it's far from finished. There's still plenty of opportunity for great projects that are going to make HRT a one-off custom truck that anybody would be proud to have in their garage. And don't forget, when this truck is done, one of you are going to win this very project. So keep watching over the next few months as HRT goes from this rolling chassis to a finished custom street truck that'll turn heads just as easily as it'll turn those massive 20s out back. So the most important thing that you guys can do is go to PowerBlockTV.com and sign up to win this thing. Hey guys, here's a tip for you that'll only cost you a cheap calculator and will help you decide what gear ratio you want to run in your project truck. Now to figure miles per hour, use this formula. Multiply your target RPM by your tire diameter. Then divide that by your rear axle ratio multiplied by your overdrive ratio times 336. Now since we know we want our target RPMs to be 2000 and our tire size is 33 inches, that half of the equation will stay constant at 66,000. We also know our Richmond Tranny has a .62 overdrive. So by plugging in different gear ratios, you can find out how fast you'll go at 2000 RPM. We're looking for a cruise speed of about 70 to 75 miles per hour. With a 411 gear ratio, we're rolling at about 78 miles per hour. By jumping up to 456s, we're at 69 miles an hour. And when we split the difference with 430s, we hit 73 miles per hour. There you have it. You can plug in different numbers and play around with rear axle ratios to see what suits your project goals the best. Thanks for watching Trucks. We'll see you guys next week. Today, Project HRT is back, and we're going to put a train in it. The drivetrain. It's a hot small block Ford six-speed transmission and a bulletproof rear end, all guaranteed to smoke this hot rod truck's 22-inch wide tires. That's all today here on Trucks. Hey, welcome to Trucks. Well, if you're a true gearhead car nut like we are, after a while, these vehicles, well, they take on personalities. They become characters. Heck, we even name them. And even people that don't live for their project vehicles, well, they can't deny that they get a certain sense or a feeling from the overall look or stance of a vehicle. And from there, well, they're hooked. Wheels and tires, well, they set the mood. Paint follows form, proportion, and style. And before long, you've created an extended member of your family with its own unique identity. And the project we're working on today shows the beginning of a pretty strong personality and a lot of genuine muscle, which is where we're going to focus right now. And if you remember, this all started when we took a little road trip up to Lawton, Michigan to Legend Motors Downs Design and gave you guys a tour of their manufacturing facility. And we got an insider's view of everything from concept drawings, clay modeling, fiberglass mold creation, all the way up to finished street rods and muscle cars and they put together one of their popular 37 Ford trucks for us, but made room for these massive Mickey Thompson HR1 wheels and Sportsman SR tires. They added a pro's pick steel bed with 40 Ford fenders, and the cab is molded with a chop top and Mini Cooper headlights in the fenders that, when assembled, give this hot rod truck looks that kill. And as you guys can see, we've got this thing all blown apart so we can pay closer attention to the foundation of our HRT project truck, namely the drivetrain, which as you guys know, is really the heart of any vehicle. Now this is far from an original 37 Ford, so obviously it's not gonna get an original engine, but we wanted to stay true to the blue oval 
and deviate from the engine a lot of guys reach for when it comes time to choosing some motivation for their street ride. <laughs> small block Chevy. That's right, he said Chevy. But the reason a lot of guys reach for a small block Chevy in their rod, even a Ford like ours, is because you can make big power with these engines and they're cheap to work on. But a lot of guys would bristle at the thought of one of these sitting in between the rails of a classic Ford. Well, we like the idea of a Ford and a Ford as well. And in our opinion, there's no better place to start than the time-tested and proven 302 small block. But we're not talking about vintage blocks. What we had in mind is what made the Fox Mustang such great performance machines. The aftermarket has built an industry on these Ford 5-liter engines. Everything from Ford's rotating assemblies to EFI upgrades. It's no big deal anymore to get around 300 ponies out of a stock block and even a little more with some basic power adders. So we did some digging, a couple of internet searches, and we came across a family-owned business out of Lebanon, New Jersey named EngineFactory.com. And they build Fords and they build Chevys, but what they specialize in are turnkey engine packages. Now, after a couple of phone conversations, some planning, letting them know what our goals were, well, this is what showed up at our door set. Now this is a great looking setup, and though it's based on a 5 liter engine, internally it's a little different. Engine Factory offers this 347 stroker engine that starts out with a 30,000th overbore, polished and deburred scat crank, steel I-beam rods, 10 to 1 forged pistons with chromoly rings, high volume oil pump, and a double roller timing set and sporting all the precision machine works it takes to clearance the block for the stroked internals. Now for the top end, hiding underneath the valve covers, we've got a full roller valve train, Edelbrock Performer RPM cylinder heads that have been massaged a little bit for better oil drain back. We've got Endurashine finish on our dual plane intake manifold and Edelbrock 650 CFM electric choke carburetor, all lit off by a Protronics distributor and a high voltage coil. Now, driving our accessories up front is this billet aluminum serpentine system from Concept One, pushing a PowerMaster 100 amp alternator and this aluminum sand and AC compressor, along with your typical dampener, water pump, and idler pulleys. Now, everything is very clearly labeled, and Engine Factory even gives you a DVD of the engine's run in. So, it's built right, it's a drop in, plug and play issue, and it requires no tuning, which makes it the perfect engine for Project HRT. Oh, and by the way, did I mention that it pushes 415 horsepower at the crank? Now we sent the transmission and engine specs and measurements to Downs while they were building the truck. So they went ahead and installed these chassis engineering engine mounts. They welded them to the frame rail, the isolator sits on the lower, and the upper is bolted to the engine block and sits on the isolator. It's a nice clean setup, but we're not quite ready to drop this engine in place yet. After the break, we'll bolt up our V8 and show you how to measure for a new drive shaft. Stick around. Hey guys, welcome back. Today, we're working on Project HRT, dropping in our engine, transmission, and the rest of the drivetrain. And today, we're just mocking everything up, starting with that 347 stroker we got from enginefactory.com. But first, let's talk about a transmission. Now, we knew we wanted a standard shift just for the fun factor, and a five-speed is a pretty common choice for a small block Ford. But we've got a 20-inch wheel with an overall tire diameter of 31 inches, so we figured an extra gear would give us the best possible performance with this combination. So we called Richmond and had them ship us one of their six-speed ROD overdrive transmissions. It features CNC machined and heat-treated internals, and total weight is only about 100 pounds. Now, we did some calculations to figure out what RPM we would be running at different speeds. And we decided on a 3.28 first gear ratio and ended up going with a .76 overdrive. Now, Richmond transmissions have a reputation of being nearly bulletproof. And one of the nice features, well, you can custom tailor your gear selection to match your vehicle's weight, engine RPM power band, rear axle ratio, tire size, etc. But really, the main reason we went with this transmission, it's a single overdrive unit compared to a lot of other late model six speeds, which have two overdrives. And the advantage here is that there's tighter gear spacing, which translates to less RPM drop as you shift. Our engine factory 347 stroker already came with the billet steel flywheel, but this one's got to come off so we can install our McLeod steel bell housing. 
Normally, this is the time that we'd install and align the clutch and pressure plate. But since we're just checking for fitment, we'll throw in the bell housing so we can bolt the transmission up. Now that six speed is gonna transfer all that power and energy back here, and we wanted something that was gonna to hold together. So we had Downs load up our chassis with a narrowed nine inch rear end housing that's held in place by this competition engineering ladder bar setup. Now don't be alarmed by all the surface rust that you see on this frame. This is a mock-up phase, and all that's gonna get taken care of later on. Now to fill up the axle housing, we had Curry Enterprises send us some 31 spline axles and a loaded third member with 430 gears and a track lock limited slip. We went with a limited slip so we could have the best of both worlds. We can send power to both rear tires and still retain some street manners without the annoying clunking or chirping of a full locker or spool. A Ford 9 inch is a common choice for a lot of car builders, mostly due to its durability. If it's good enough for NASCAR, it's good enough for us, but it's also easy to work on since the third member comes easily away from the housing. With the engine bolted to the bell housing and transmission, We'll set it on the rear cross member and front isolators and check for any clearance issues with the SERP system up front. But the most important thing this step gives us is the ability to see what length drive shaft we need. When you're measuring your drive shaft, go from the end of the tail housing to the center line of the yoke, and we've got exactly 48 inches. But also make a note at how much the output shaft sticks out of the tail housing, which is about 3 eighths of an inch in our case. Give this information to whoever's building your drive shaft, and they can manufacture the correct amount of slip travel based on the rest of the chassis. Now, with this short of a space, we can go with a lightweight, one-piece aluminum drive shaft that's going to look good and be strong enough to get the job done, too. Now don't put your tape measure away just yet. You still got to give the drive shaft shop some U-joint dimensions. And the measurements they're after are the U-joint cross diameter and the cap width. To measure the cross diameter, if the U-joint yoke has locating tabs, you measure in between the tabs. In our case, we've got three and five eighths. If you don't have the locating tabs, you measure in between the flats of the yoke. And for the cap diameter, well, there's generally three choices. You have an inch and a sixteenth, inch and an eighth, and inch and three sixteenths. In our case, we had inch and an eighth. Up next, we'll show you how to set up a chassis for caster, camber, and tow. And later, we'll install our new drive shaft. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. Well, the foundation to Project HRT is really starting to come together and take shape. And it doesn't hurt that we had such a great head start with a full rolling chassis from Downs. But there's a lot of work to do yet before one of you can drive it home. So today, we're mocking up the drivetrain, checking for things like fit and clearance. One of the nice things about starting with a chassis like this, aside from the fully boxed frame that looks like a piece of art, is that it's outfitted for modern components and systems like independent front suspension and rack and pinion steerings. But there are still some things that you're going to need to take care of. When it comes to setting up a chassis properly, well, there's a lot of things to consider. But regardless of the style of suspension you're running, there's a few basic ground rules to follow. Let's start with steering geometry. For the front end, there's three basic variables you have to work with, camber, caster, and tow. Camber is the lean of the tire as viewed from above. With the tire leaning out, you've got positive camber. The leaning in, negative. The caster, well, that's the imaginary line drawn between the upper and lower control arm ball joints as it passes through the steering knuckle. With it leaned back a little bit, you're looking at positive caster. That's what gives the car the return to center feel after you make a turn. It also helps the vehicle track straight at speed. But too much caster, it'll increase steering effort. And tow in and tow out, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. When the front of the tires are pointing in towards each other, you've got a tow in condition. Point it out, look at it tow out. So we're using a fairly common and not too expensive home alignment tool to measure caster and camber. And to measure tow, well, like we showed you guys before, we can just use a tape measure. But remember that all we're doing right now is getting things close. Later on, when the body's on the frame, we've got the full vehicle weight on the suspension, then we can dial it in for real. With the gauge at the wheel hub center, turn the wheels until they're at a 20 degree angle to the frame rail. Then zero out the bubble and turn the wheels to the opposite position, which is just about a complete lock-to-lock -lock turn, and then check the caster bubble. Now with the vehicle weight off the chassis, we can adjust caster by disconnecting the upper arm from the frame mount and turning the adjusters in at the rear and out at the front, pitching the center of the arm back, creating the positive caster we want. Then everything gets reassembled and checked by the gauge. Oh, 
Oh, cool. We're at like three and a quarter degrees positive. What'd you end up with? It's about three and a half. Good. That's right on. So with both sides between three and three and a half degrees positive caster, it's time to measure for camber. We got nothing. No camber. Straight up and down. Need a little lean in at the top. What you got? Zero. All right, so we're in pretty good shape. We're not gonna make any adjustments now. What we're after is between zero and one degree negative camber. And as the body and all the weight settles on the chassis, well, the suspension will compress and we'll probably gain a little bit of camber. Now, if we do need to make an adjustment, we'll come down here to the lower control arm because just like the uppers, they're adjustable. But on the lowers, we want to move both ends in and out equally so we don't alter the caster adjustment we've made up top. To measure for toe, find a common reference point like the center mold line or even a tread to compare the front to the back. Yep. Okay, 55 and an eighth. 54 and a quarter. Well, that tells us we're towed out almost a complete inch, so we'll adjust from the tie rod ends equally on each side. Since there's no adjusting sleeve, like typically found on an OEM tie rod, we'll take the rod end out of the knuckle on each side and turn it clockwise to bring the front measurement in more. We're at 54 and 3 quarter. All right. All right, 54 and almost 7 eighths. So we're a 16th of an inch towed in, which is right in spec. Now the rear suspension is adjustable as well, but unlike the front, it only has one real job to do, plant the power to the ground. So as long as you're tracking straight and the rear axle is perpendicular with the center line in the vehicle, you should be pretty well set. But the important thing here is the pinion angle, which is set under full chassis load and adjusted here at the ladder bars. And we'll do that when the truck's just about complete. For now, all we're really worried about is squaring up this rear axle. The ladder bars use heim joints for mounting points, which are threaded into the link bars and adjustable. All we're after here is getting the left side moved forward a quarter inch and we'll be tracking completely straight. Let's see, 24 and a half. 24 and a half. We're square. That's about all we can do for now. Hey, thanks for sticking with us as we mock up the chassis of Project HRT. And now, about all we got left to do is drop in our drive shaft. So with our U-joint dimension and drive shaft length measurements in hand, we gave Advantage Driveline a call. And they sent us this great looking lightweight aluminum drive shaft. It's fully balanced and features a steel input yoke that of course matches the spline count of our Richmond six-speed tranny. Now if you're wondering why we didn't go with a larger diameter aluminum drive shaft, well for one, it's relatively short at only about four feet. And two, well, we've got a bit of a clearance issue here with the frame. So we went with a three inch diameter tube. And according to Advantage Driveline, even with the built 347, 430 gears, and these big old tires out back, we won't have any issues transferring the power. Now the reason that your pinion is always going to be offset one way or the other is to initiate needle bearing rotation. Otherwise you end up with what's called a Bernelling effect to where the needle bearings actually establish a wear pattern inside the bearing cup. So one to two degrees of offset ensures needle bearing rotation and a smooth, long life for your universal joints. Well, there you go. Everything dropped right in and fit really well. We are off to a great start on Project HRT. Let me just got to smooth out some of these welds and get rid of some of that surface rust. Yeah, and that way we can give this chassis the degree of detail that it deserves. If you're not sure about working on fiberglass, then don't be. Today we're doing body work on Project HRT and showing you how to work glass the right way. We're cleaning up the seams in the panels and we'll show you how to flush mount LED taillights for an even cleaner look. That's all today here on Trucks. Hey, welcome to the shop and thanks for watching Trucks. Well, today we're going to jump with both feet into a subject that some people consider to be automotive voodoo, bodywork, and not just your average run-of-the-mill bodywork on sheet metal, fiberglass bodywork. 
Now, if you've been around body shops much, you've heard the rumors about what kind of a royal pain fiberglass cars are to work on. And replicas in kit cars can be even worse, but that's not always the case. In fact, fiberglass has huge advantages over sheet metal, and being able to customize it faster and easier is just one of them. So it's not necessarily more difficult to work on, it's just a different animal. So today, we're gonna bust some of those myths and show you guys that customizing or repairing body damage on a fiberglass vehicle is something you can do, no problem. And today's victim is Project HRT, our Legend Motors 37 Ford that's already customized and looks as straight as a lot of finished paint jobs, even though it's still in raw gel coat. But it's still got the mold line right here from the two-part manufacturing process. Now, it seems fair to assume you could just sand these lines flat spray on some high build primer, block it, and paint it. But a lot of guys have been bitten by these mold lines showing through or mapping through their paint job, and here's why. Now a cross section of that mold line would look something like this, and you can see that if you just resurface that mold line and level it down with the rest of the panel surrounding it, well it's going to expose these layers of gel coat, which are harder than the polyester material underneath it. And eventually, due to the curing of the fiberglass and natural heating and cooling cycles, well these lines are going to show through your paint and they can't be buffed out. So the way to get around that is to completely remove the entire cross section of layers that are being exposed and fill it in with a material that's as strong as the gel coat. And then you can do your paint and body work on top of that. And that all starts with removing this mold line here. Now this is a messy job. So wear the appropriate safety gear to protect yourself and do it in a well ventilated area. We're using our downdraft prep station to remove the fiberglass particles from the air. And uh, by the way, when you're done, wash up with cold water. Warm water will open up your skin's pores, allowing the fiberglass particles to get in even deeper, making you itch worse. Ryan's using a carbide burr and grinding about an inch outside the mold line and digging about an eighth of an inch deep into the polyester. While Ryan works on the rear fenders, check out the doghouse. Now, when we first got this truck, the body panels were pre-fit, but not finished, which is perfect for us because it gives us options. For instance, we can do things like filling these seams, rolling lines, smoothing things over, basically putting our own personal custom touches on this truck. And since Legend Motors cures their bodies before delivery, there's no worries of anything shifting or changing shape on us. So one of the things that we're gonna do is smooth this area up in here and bond these panels together so that when we open the hood, we look down in here and everything looks like a real street rod. Using 50 grit discs, we can rough up the surface on each side so the adhesive has something to grab onto as it cures. Okay, hold it right there, right? Now these bolts only serve as locators. They'll come back out after the adhesive is set up, which is gonna take about 30 minutes. After that, we'll use fiberglass to fill in the holes. All right, with the mold line gouged out, I went ahead and sanded the edges using 80 grit. Then we'll fill in that gouge with this two-part epoxy we got from Legend Motors. The epoxy is mixed at a five to one ratio and will stay workable for about 20 minutes. Okay, with our inner aprons bonded to the outer fender, let's take a look at these hood sides. Now these holes that you see were drilled in here purely for the mock-up stage. These holes are going to get filled in and these edges smoothed over and that's going to start with 36 grit on a grinder. We're using short strand filler to bridge the gap between the two panels, which will take about 10 minutes to set up. With the epoxy dry, my fenders are ready. Now it's just a matter of leveling it out to the height of the surrounding gel coat. Now we'll follow that with some 80 grit, just to smooth over some of the deep scratches. And now it's ready for the next step. This is not epoxy or Bondo. The short strand fiberglass sets up as hard and as strong as the panels around it, making it less likely to crack or shrink back. 
and the sander will knock the basic shape into the filler, but you always want to come back with a hand board and do your final shaping by hand. All right, our gaps are filled, our screw holes are filled, we got everything blocked down with 80 grit, now we're ready for primer surfacer, and the blocking starts all over again. When we come back from the break, we're going to show you guys how to gel coat those rear fenders. Stick around. Up next, it looks like we're ruining the taillights, but have a little faith. And later, we'll lay out and mount our gauges. Stick around. Welcome back, and thanks for watching Trucks. Today, we're working over the fiberglass body of Project HRT and giving you guys a few tips on working with fiberglass. Now, what we're going to do next is not something that you see every day. Well, I've been to 14 county fairs and a horse marriage, and I hadn't seen this technique until we went to Legend Motors to pick our truck up. And what those guys do is to spray gel coat over top of a repair, and that way they create a rock-solid foundation that's ready for whatever type of work you have to do over top of it. The gel coat is reduced approximately 5% with acetone to make it sprayable, and then mixed in a 10 to 1 ratio with MEK hardener. Now this will take three coats to get the proper coverage and will be about 15 mils thick, which is plenty thick enough to block or prep for filler. Now like we were talking about earlier, having a fiberglass body gives you plenty of options when it comes to custom treatment. And since this is far from a stock truck right out of the box, well you're not going to offend anybody if you want to change things up a bit and throw in some custom touches. And since we've already got Mini Cooper headlights molded into the front fenders, well we want to do something trick for the taillights as well because customizing is all about putting your own stamp on a vehicle. Now we started shopping around and found a couple of cool LED lighting options from Watson Streetworks, like this one-piece sequential LED tail light kit. Now we ended up going with Watson's two-piece sequential kit that includes all the wiring and hardware, lenses and buckets, with enough material on the lenses to allow it to be flush mounted and sanded down smooth for a nice clean look. Now instead of mounting them in the fenders, we're going to sink them into the roll pan right here. Now working with fiberglass sucks because it's itchy, but in a lot of ways it's easier than working with sheet metal. For instance, cutting out the recesses to sink our taillights in is a very simple procedure and starts with a pilot hole on each side. Now we'll switch to a half inch bit and utilizing our pilot holes, we create a perfectly rounded end that matches our taillight lens. Perfect, that's what I wanted. Now the lens is higher than the fiberglass around it. And this beveled edge around here, it looks like a mistake, but it's not. Because when we put the filler in there, we can block it all smooth, and it's gonna hold the lens in perfectly. and my filler's finally dry, and I hadn't done anything. But it takes that long for this fiberglass to set up. Now, if you look, you think we made a mess, but hey, have a little faith. Now, this solve is just a cheap trick to show you guys what this is gonna look like finished up. So I'm gonna hit this with 600 grit while you guys take a break. Welcome back to Trucks. If you're just joining us, we're tweaking the bodywork on our fiberglass 37 Ford Project HRT. Now, the last step in flush mounting these LED taillights we got from Watson Streetworks is mounting the buckets in the back of the roll pan. Now, we've had to trim this guy to compensate for the, the license plate bracket here. And we also glassed in a couple of the screws that came with the kit to hold the bucket in place. From here, all we have left to do is wire this into the chassis when we put everything together. An original 37 Ford had a steel dash that looked a lot more like an old jukebox than this cool looking wraparound dash that Jamie Downs designed. But like a lot of things on this truck, it left the gauge placement up to us. Now obviously, you want to put your gauges where you can see them, because how else are you going to keep tabs of what's going on underneath the hood? But typically, the speedometer is centered in front of the driver, with the rest of the gauges on either side. 
but this dash is pretty small. So grouping everything together on the left side well, is just going to be cluttered and make the gauges hard to read. There's nothing wrong with the spacing and configuration of the way these autometer gauges are packed. So we're just going to use the box as our template. And the cab is small enough that we can put the gauges right in the center and still see them from the driver's seating position. Now we'll use a hole saw kit to get close and trim the edges of the openings carefully since we don't have a lot of flange on these gauges. Now just like the rest of this truck, the fiberglass on the dash is nice, but it's not perfect. And we've got something really cool planned for these pieces. You'll have to keep on watching to see what we do. And since some of these edges are visible from the outside of the truck, well, we're going to sand them down and make them as smooth as possible. Now this is just part of the deal when working with fiberglass. You're going to get some air pockets. And since that's an exposed edge, well, we've got to fill it. So here's a little tip for you if you're doing detail work like that. Small job, small tool. Using a single edge razor blade to mix your filler allows you to apply it with greater accuracy and less cleanup. Depending on your mix ratio, this stuff will set up pretty fast. So within a couple of minutes, you're ready to sand and then prime. Now we really like the symmetrical look of the dash. And really, from the driver's seat, you've got a perfect view of all the gauges. Plus, it leaves us room on either side for AC vents. And we'll come up with some sort of center console that has a radio and switches and stuff like that. But if you're putting together a truck like this, well, the cool thing about it, there's no wrong way to do it. You can lay this stuff out any way you want to. After all, it's your truck. After the break, our flaws can't hide from the light. So we'll keep smoothing things out. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Trucks. Today, we're smoothing out a few rough edges on Project HRT. And I gotta tell you, I'm a little itchy. It feels like I've been insulating a house. Now, that's okay, the effort is well worth it. And the work we're doing on this body, well, it's gonna make the paint job smooth as glass. Now, we've talked an awful lot about how nice the gel coat is on these panels. There's no TV magic going on here. This stuff is nice and straight, but it's not quite ready for paint yet. For instance, if you take a look at the reflection of this PDR light we got from Autobody Toolmart, you can see that the reflection is distorted. And that means the panel has waves in it. Now, fixing the waves is easy. Seeing them is the hard part. But if you can learn to read a movable light, well, you can smooth out every inch. All right, with our low spots marked, now it's time to fix them. And we'll do that by cross blocking with 120 grit on a 24 inch Dura block. Cross blocking means using the leading edge of the block and making an X pattern as you travel. This uses the straight edge of the block to level the surface you're working on. All right, this is the low spot that the light showed us earlier. And what we're gonna do is keep working this area until we bring the surrounding gel coat down to the same height as our low spot. This right here is a real good indicator on when to stop because the gel coat's getting real thin and we don't want to go any further. And for these spots right here, well, we'll come back, spray them with some high build primer and block again. Our goal here is to create a pleasant viewing experience on our street rod by eliminating as many inconsistencies as possible, like this door gap. It's narrow at the top and gets progressively wider as it gets down to the bottom, but it's hard to see in here because the gel coat's black and the panel gap is black, so we're gonna fix that. By spraying a light-colored primer over the gap, it highlights the problem areas and creates a contrast that's easy to read. Okay, now take a look again and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's narrow at the top and gets wider as it gets to the bottom. So now what we're gonna do is take a sanding board with 80 grit paper and just work the door edge to widen the gap. Let's 
getting better. Now the panel gap is consistent, you can tell just by looking at it, but you can check it with a homemade gauge made with one of these paint stir sticks. It's about an eighth of an inch wide. You can just slide it in, just like gapping a spark plug. Yeah, that's nice. If you're wondering why we're paying so much attention to detail on this truck, well, it's because we want to be proud of it. We want to put our stamp on this thing because one of you guys gets to win it when we're done. So keep watching and follow the buildup of this 37 Ford and go to PowerBlockTV.com to find out how to win this thing. Thanks for watching, trucks. See you guys next week. Hey, welcome to Trucks. Well, today we're checking in on some friends of ours over here at Bay One Customs in Springfield, Tennessee, one of the Nashville area's premier custom automotive shops. And they say they got a little surprise cooking for us. Now, you guys have seen their work before. Bay One is responsible for this incredible COE Chevrolet truck that we had on Power Block a while back. They also finished that crazy looking 65 El Camino that looks like a full size Hot Wheels car. So when TC and the guys offered to help us with one of our projects, well, we'd already seen the quality work they do. Yeah, and we jumped at the chance to include some of their craftsmanship in one of our trucks projects. But before we get to that, we wanted to show you guys some of the finished and unfinished vehicles that you haven't seen. Now this beautiful 47 Ford two-door sedan, it's a great mix of restoration and resto mod. And although this thing looks like it could be a trailer queen, Bay One builds them to be driven. And this car's got the miles and the dead bugs to prove it. And check out this 46 Ford pickup. Now this one's been updated as well. It's got an automatic transmission, nice comfy bucket seats, and air conditioning. And this thing's looking pretty good, especially considering it's been completed and has been a driver for over a decade. Hey Ryan, take a look at this vet. These panel gaps are perfect. Yeah, when you look at it, you can just see the attention to detail that went into this thing. From what they tell me, it started out pretty rough. These cars did not look this good from the factory. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> now we've seen some good looking finished vehicles. Now let's go find some work in process. Now down this hall, that's where the heavy lifting happens. <laughs> wow. Now this is the fab shop. Hey Tommy, what are you doing here? Hey, got here a little early and these guys talked me into giving them a hand. Bay One has a couple of part-time employees and a lot of friends that help out. But the main ingredients are T.C. Panic and Butch Kerr. Both of these guys have a wide variety of skills to draw from, and together they take on almost any project, from classic restorations to wild customs and street rods. Uh, I've worked on cars and equipment my whole life. When I was a kid, uh, my first go-kart, I disassembled it, had it in a million parts. Uh, later on, I got a motorcycle, and that's the first thing I did was took it apart, put it back together. And I've just had a love of working on cars and equipment, and especially the specialty cars and antiques and custom street rods. For instance, take a look at this 1958 Chevrolet pickup. It's getting small block V8 power, an overdrive transmission, and a host of other body and suspension mods that'll make it more street rod than truck. And this International Scout has had some extensive fab work including altering the wheel arches for tire clearance, but the proportion is perfect and looks factory correct. The 53 F100 gets a one-piece tilt front end along with some classic custom tricks, like the French antenna. But no matter how diverse the vehicle is, Bay One's main driving force with everything they do, a heartfelt passion for the hobby. We start by coming up with a theme, and then we tear it down and bag it and tag it, and restore all the pieces and replace what can't be restored and then shine it all up and sand the heck out of it and put it together. And as long as the customer will allow us to do our best, they're always happy at the end. Now these are some really cool projects you guys got going on. I know these guys have a ton of hours in the frame of our 37. I can't wait to see it. So where are you hiding it? We got it waiting for you out front. Let's go see it. Let's do it, man. <laughs> Nice. Man, that is impressive looking. Looks like a show quality job. 
Every inch of this frame has been blocked and primed and blocked again. Every weld is smooth. It looks like it's dipped in this flat clear. TC, you guys rocked on this thing. Thanks so much for all the work you put in it. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to get to do this for you. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Now we got to make sure the rest of the build is on par with what was established here. Let's go get the truck and sing back to the shop. All right. Man, that thing looks awesome. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Now that we're back in the shop, all the hard work the guys at Bay One put into HRT's chassis really shows. So now it's up to us to make sure that the standard that Bay One has already set with this frame, well, the rest of the truck has got to meet that standard. And that's going to mean a whole lot of time put into those body panels. In fact, the whole body of the truck has to be test fit and mocked up before it even goes to paint. That way, there's no surprises when it comes to final assembly. So we're going to start by dropping in the engine and transmission, then setting the cab in place and laying out our shifter location and the rest of the interior. You good? Yep, perfect. Here it is. The shifter gets removed for clearance, and then we make sure to protect 100 hours worth of paint and bodywork on the frame. The cab gets set down with the help of a couple of buddies. There it is. Once we make sure it's in the right place, we can trim for the shifter position, which starts with drilling a pilot hole from the bottom and trimming a little at a time with the reciprocating saw. With the steel floor, we could just weld in a patch if we made a mistake. But with glass, it's a little more involved and a lot more time consuming to rebuild structural strength. So after trimming only enough of the floor to clearance the range of motion in all six gears, we can finally reinstall the shifter and start thinking about the rest of the interior. Okay, how does that look? Is that where it's gonna sit? Yep. Oh, we're in good shape. Plenty of clearance. There's a room under here, too. Now, with our shifter installed, we've got a decision to make about seating. Now, there's a few obstacles we're gonna have to deal with due to limited space in the cab, as well as limited visibility because of the chopped top. Now, we gathered up a few seats that were laying around the tech center to try out. We've got a low back bucket out of a Mustang, an old school race seat, a high back bucket seat out of a Jeep Cherokee, a full blown race seat, and this seat out of an old muscle car. So we'll try these different styles out and see what works best. The muscle car seat gave us good clearance to the shifter, but restricted our view out the back window. We could live with that issue if we had to, but there's better options. The racing seat would be cool and gives us the clearance we want, <laughs> but it's just not the right vibe for this project. Maybe. The Cherokee high back bucket was comfortable. No way. But it made the truck feel a little like an 18-wheeler. <laughs> this feels like a tractor. <laughs> no. The vintage racing seat might work in a rat rod, but not in HRT. I feel like I need some Snoopy goggles. <laughs> we need something a little more classic. Wake me up in an hour. <sighs> now that's what I'm talking about. Put the steering wheel right in the middle. By far the most comfortable seat well, let's just say it didn't leave much leg room, but it slept great. We both agreed that the style we liked was a low back bucket seat from a vintage Mustang. It's actually pretty good. Yep. A little far back. That could work. This is not bad. From a Mustang. It gave us the clearance we needed for the shifter, as well as the visibility we wanted out of the back glass. Yeah. Now, we've already got a manual steering rack from Flaming River in the 37, so we're going to stick with the recommendation of Legend Motors and use this Flaming River tilt column that's specifically designed for street rods with a limited amount of space under the dash. Now, this column utilizes a double drop for support, and each drop is made from billet aluminum, and it's polished to a mirror finish for a great street rod look. Polished stainless steel U-joints, support joint, and double D-shaft will take care of the connection between the column and the rack. And for steering wheels, you guys already know that the sky's the limit for choices. We've got ours narrowed down to a choice between these two wheels, and to be quite honest with you, I don't know which one's going to look better. The steering column placement is probably the most important job in laying out your interior and starts with centering the column to the driver and marking the dash. With the relief cut out of the dash, we can mark the position of the drops. Using one inch angle, Ryan tacks in a support that gives us a pivot point to gauge the angle of the column. And tack in a second drop. Obviously, the steering shaft needs to go through the firewall to connect with the rack, so a hole is drilled. But the important thing to remember here is not to create hard angles that might cause binding as you turn the wheel. Using coat hangers or TIG wire, you can create a path and make a template for routing. 
Then use it to measure and cut your actual double D shaft once. The steering shaft is test fit from the rack, working our way backward. And since the engine and exhaust placement won't allow a straight shot to the firewall, a support bearing is used to make the connection. Cool. All we need is a bracket for the support joint and we're done. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. If you're just joining us, we're back on Project HRT, our 37 Ford Street Rod truck that is destined to end up in one of your garages before it's all said and done. And today, we're test fitting everything, mocking things up before it goes to final paint, and that includes the glass. Now, this flat glass has already been pre-cut for this truck, so it's not something that we have to worry about. But if you've got a truck like this, 1950 Chevy of Tommy's, where he's chopped the top three inches and the factory flat glass is still the stock size, well, you got a choice to make. You can either farm it out to a glass shop and cross your fingers and hope it turns out okay, or you can do it yourself. We're gonna show you how. Now to get started, you need just a few basic tools. Your commonly available glass cutter and a pair of plate pliers come in handy. And since we're dealing with a safety glass, you got to get through the laminate that separates the two pieces of glass. That's where the flammable liquid comes in. Now you would think since three inches was taken out of the top, you just take three inches out of your glass and everything would be okay. But it's got to be more precise than that. So you definitely want to make a template. You can use a fiber board like we did or some heavy cardboard for your template. And then just trace out the window opening. After installing the factory rubber gasket that's been cut at the windshield peak to compensate for the chop, you can work your template into the channel for a test fit. Now this is why we made a template first. As you can see, we got another 3 16 to a quarter inch in the windshield rubber channel, so we'll make that adjustment before we cut our glass. All right, with our template traced out, now we're almost ready to cut. But before we do that, you're gonna wanna make sure you have a lightweight oil to dip your cutting wheel in. Otherwise, the wheel gets hot, the glass flakes and chips, and you get an unwanted run when you go to break it. Following his traced line, Ryan uses steady and consistent pressure to run the glass cutter, being careful to use one continuous motion. This reduces the chance of the crack drifting off the cut line that you want. Now, using the ball end of the cutter, tap along your cut line to break the glass in a controlled path along the scored surface. Flip the glass over and then follow the same line with the cutter, lightly scoring the other side and tapping and breaking the second layer of laminated glass. Now make sure you've got a fire extinguisher on hand for this step. Using a flammable liquid that will seep into the crack, lighting it on fire simply melts the plastic material in between the glass allowing you to separate the two pieces of your cut and trim the laminate with a blade. The plate pliers just give you a little more control over a tight corner. Then making sure your glass stays wet to keep it cool, you can use a belt sander with a fine belt or a high-speed rotary sander to round off the corners and trim the glass to its final size. Now with the glass cut, we'll use some quarter-inch nylon rope to install the glass into the channel and you've just saved yourself a couple hundred bucks. That's it. Looks good out here. That fits like it's supposed to. That's good. HRT uses a steel pros pick bed with an oak wood floor. Now oak is a natural choice for a pickup bed because it's a dense wood which makes it very strong and it's got a beautiful grain. Now these slats have already been stained and varnished and they look great. We don't actually have to do anything to the floor here, but we wanted to do something a little different with this project. And a while back we were at Strip Masters having a frame media blasted and we noticed something really cool. They had a wooden stand on wheels that they used to roll parts into the blasting booth. Now, just over the passage of time, the blast media had attacked the surface of the wood, creating this cool topographical effect where the soft part of the wood was eaten away, leaving these ridges in the wood, which created this really neat textured effect. And that is what we're gonna do. The oak bed slats will take a little longer than this pine, but the end result will be the same an interesting and unique wood treatment that raises the grain of the wood and really shows off its beauty. Now this probably isn't practical for a daily driver that's gonna get used for work, but HRT is a show truck and it's all about the cool factor. 
And what you end up with is the coolest thing since sliced bread. This looks like a piece of 100-year-old driftwood. And I prepped another piece the same way, but I used a mahogany wood stain and a clear lacquer. And the results, well, they're outstanding. Now, this just goes to show you that it pays to think out of the box and do something a little bit different. So, guys, don't be afraid to take some chances, because that's the only way you can make your truck your own. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. We're here at one of our favorite places to visit, Advanced Plating in Nashville, Tennessee. Advanced Plating is one of the best chrome shops in the country, and we've used them several times on projects in the past. Now, since HRT is an all-glass body, we came up with a pretty cool idea. Now, our truck features a wraparound fiberglass dash, and we thought it would look really unique, totally chromed. Now you guys remember our friend Steve Tracy who owns Advanced Plating and we've got obviously a piece of fiberglass here. So Steve, explain how this is prepped to us. Well, what we do, Kevin, was we start off by prepping the surface by media blasting it and then we clean it with an anti-static cleaner. We also apply studs to the back of the part for conductivity and to hang our part in the plating tank. And that gets it ready for coating. Yes, sir. Cool. Is this first coating some sort of primer? That is correct. That is a three component adhesive filling primer. What we do is we take the material and the reducer and the catalyst and we spray it on there and allow it to dry for 24 hours. And the other coating on the other side, is that just a, uh, another primer? Well, that's actually a copper conductive coating and it is sprayed over the top of the pro lane. It's reduced down because it's very thick material. Spray it on, allow it to dry for 24 hours. That allows it to be plated? That's right, we'll go straight to the copper tank, Ryan. Let's go check it out. All right. The conductive primer sprays like any high build primer with a large orifice gun in a controlled environment for safety. This completely coats the part fooling the rest of the chroming process into being able to plate it like steel. A quick test confirms we're ready for the next step. The parts are then dipped in the copper tank using the electrodes to deliver the current and the copper layers. Now we told you chroming plastic is no big deal for these guys. This is actually going to be a chrome plated plastic skid plate for a Chevy Avalanche. And I'm using the term skid plate very loosely. Using sanders and grinders to level out the copper is where the foundation of chrome plating is created. Without this care and attention to detail, the reflection of the chrome can get distorted and show flaws and imperfections, and that is just not their style. Now, as beautiful as this piece is, it's still not finished. So by the time our fiberglass dash is at the same stage as this fiberglass cover, well, the process is the same as plating steel, right? Exactly, Kevin. True electroplated nickel and chrome over the top of fiberglass. Your dash is going to look just like these 37 Ford grills here that are also made out of fiberglass. Well, I can't wait to see it. Now, we can get these back in a couple of days, right? Looks like we better get busy. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Today, we're painting Project HRT. First, we're planning out what makes for a great looking and timeless paint job for our hot rod truck. Then it's off to the booth to spray more than a dozen different layers of paint. And after all that, we'll put it all together to check out the coolest paint job to ever roll out of the truck shop. It's all today, here on Trucks. Hey, welcome to Trucks. Well, check out Project HRT now. It's looking like a truck again, and it's getting closer and closer to being ready for one of you lucky viewers to take it home and add it to your collection. And just in case you haven't entered, the contest is still open, and you can't win if you don't enter. Now, the body is finally ready for paint, but it took a ton of work, and we've kept pretty good track. We figure we have almost 300 hours to get it in the shape it's in now. While our buddies at Bay One Customs smoothed and painted the frame for us, we got to work on the fiberglass and blocked and blocked and fit and blocked some more because that's what it takes to get a true high-end custom paint job on your vehicle. After we set the engine down into its new home, we then mated the body panels back to the frame for a final mock-up and test fit and then proceeded to prime and block and block some more. Which brings us to a very important place in any project, planning the overall look and appearance of your vehicle, the paint job, which takes a lot of preparation, something you just can't wing in the paint booth. And having a plan will save you time, money, and disappointment. Now, you can't build a house without blueprints, 
and you can't do a full-on custom paint job without knowing what your end goals are. So we assembled a team of automotive designers and started with a blank slate. Two seven two tone. I like the idea of a two tone because we've got a perfect style line right there mm -hmm. to break it up. And the Top bed on the back. Line. Yeah, yeah, the bed. It's not really in the same line, but that would give it nice proportion too. Mm -hmm. Steve Longacre, our in-house graphic artist, Tommy Boschers, Ryan, and myself all have some pretty strong opinions when it comes to our projects, and having the chance to toss around some ideas really helps get a perspective. Now, nothing says hot rod like flames. But there are so many styles to draw from, and we want this paint job to be perfect for HRT. Now you've got the grill is a great launching point. Mm -hmm. Right up here off the grill into that division. Mm -hmm. I think that's nice. Flames are a must, and a two-tone would look great too, if the colors are right. Color sometimes dates a design. Mm -hmm. I mean, you remember the, in the late 80s, mm -hmm. it was all the pastel, pastel. Yep. exactly, right. exactly. Right. Even the style of the flames, too, we can get to that later. But color, I don't know, I, I, I want to grab something universal so that in 20 years, this thing still Still looks too. good. Yeah. yeah. And you also want to stay away from a lot of metallics and, and can, or those kind of candies that will be hard to match. Yeah, any yeah. touch up. Yeah. yeah. Touch it up later. Well, yeah. if you've ever Even. seen a 10-year-old candy job, you know that they fade out in the sun right. if it gets any kind of street use mm -hmm. at all. And we're hoping somebody drives this thing. So well, yeah. you know it'll be sitting at a few car shows here and there, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to see the sunlight. So we want it to be a matchable color, we want it to be easy to repair if they have to, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're leaning towards a solid color too, right? Solid yeah. colors. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, just a yeah. basic primary color, nothing Classic crazy. Classic colors too. You know, yeah, something yeah. traditional. Yeah. yeah. So to really visualize our paint scheme, we pulled out the crayons. And one of the great things about planning on paper first is that you can truly see and judge all the different opinions. The two-tone looks right, but the colors just don't pop. The solid colors are cool, but we're trying to make more of a statement. Ryan was definitely thinking out of the box with purple and gray, but it still wasn't totally hot rod. Tommy had a great idea with black and gold, but that combo has already been done with a certain Le Mans. We all agreed that Steve hit the nail on the head with the solid red on the bottom and the black on the top. To us, that color combination screamed hot rod truck. Yeah, if we're gonna do a two-tone, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a question of what style of flame. Yeah, I think we yeah. keep it kind of timeless and go with like a, yeah, a classic flame. Yeah. Nice, long, stretched out. Mm -hmm. Licks, you know, mm -hmm. to really show off the fender lines and the, uh, the style of the truck. Something like that. I like them. I wish it would maybe follow the style line a little bit more. Yeah, it needs to follow the lines of the body more. What do you guys think about something like that? That's not bad. A little heavy, isn't it? Yeah, just a little. Just a little big. What do you think? Real simple. It's not bad. It's nice and clean, but it's almost too simple for a truck that's kind of over the top. Yeah, yeah, it begs for more, doesn't it? But I like how it follows the style line. In the end, Steve's rendering, borrowing from everybody's ideas, gave us a flame design that worked for everybody. What do you want to do for like, colors on the flame? Just... I'd say more of a white to orange traditional with yeah. oh, yeah. the purple uh, tips. Just a nice color fade throughout, almost following the spectrum of color, white into maybe purple at the tips. Yeah. Steve had one more suggestion to really make this paint job come to life. If we're going to do the red and black, do a screen delineation between the two colors. Just something subtle, colors. right? Nothing yeah. too right. too wide. Yeah, yeah nothing maybe. in your face. But that he's right. It'll make it pop. It'll yeah. make it okay. pop. Compliment. I like that long sweeping flames coming off of the grill, dividing the two colors. Yep. That's yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. cool. Pretty clear why we work on cars and you do the creative <laughs> art thing. <laughs> nice job. So, armed with a pretty accurate rendering of what we all wanted to see, we had a plan. And we definitely had our work cut out for us, starting with one final round of hand sanding and blocking with the final urethane primer surface or using 400 grit paper. And when you're final sanding, it's your last chance to make sure that everything is straight, so it's time well spent. Up next, the paint's gonna start flying as the base colors hit the glass. And later, all the pieces come together to make metal, fiberglass, and paint become Project HRT. Don't go anywhere.
Hey, welcome back to Trucks. While the guys are in the booth prepping for paint, I'm in here taking care of a few things on the chassis, like these headers that we got from Sanderson. And these make for a nice clean installation on a street rod. They've got a patented leak-proof flange, nice durable ceramic coating, plus Sanderson hooked us up with these angled reducers to help us keep the exhaust tucked up in the frame rails. Now you've seen this guy around helping us today on Project HRT. This is Brian Barker from Legend Motors, the people that make these bodies. Now Brian's an award-winning custom painter, so check out some of the work that he's done that's been featured in calendars and magazines. Now that is some nice looking work. And since Brian has had his hands on his fair share of these trucks, he's a handy guy to have around right now. Now we're getting these panels ready to apply some color. They've already been final sanded with 400 grit. We're wiping them with some alcohol to get rid of the static electricity. Now you're gonna see us use these gun hangers and booth boxes. They're made by the Kerrigan Corp and they're designed by a painter for painters. They feature strong magnetic attachments so you don't have to drill holes in your booth to mount them. They offer storage for tape, tweezers, tack racks, all the things you need to reach for while you're in the middle of a paint job that you don't want to have covered in overspray. Now the panels we've got in the booth only require one of the colors of our two-tone, so we're going to get them colored and cleared and out of the way so we can focus on the cool part of our custom paint job. Another good thing about painting any pre-war fat-fendered vehicle apart is that you can reach every corner and every angle of the panels. If you were to try and paint the front and rear fenders with the vehicle assembled, you'd never get an even coating of color, and especially not clear, and you'd end up with a lot of dry spray. It takes longer this way, but it's worth it. With the color and clear laid down, these parts get set in a corner to dry, and the main canvas of our custom job gets rolled in, namely the cab and hood sides. Now, DuPont paint has been around for decades, but DuPont's Hot Hues line is a relative newcomer in the custom painting scene. They've got a great array of factory packaged colors, as well as a nice line of candies that allow you to build your own custom colors. Hot Hues is user-friendly, it's easy to spray, and it's a high-quality coating system. So it's what we're going to be spraying all the way through this custom paint job. The cab has been prepped just like the rest of the body, 400 grit wet and wiped down with alcohol to lose the static charge. But we've used the braces to mock up the hood sides exactly like they sit when the truck is fully assembled. This makes sure our flames will line up when we reassemble the body after final clear coats. Then the cab gets coated in hot hues, firecracker red factory package color. Following our rendering as a guide, the two-tone gets established right below the style line. This allows us to be able to focus the flame job below the hood. The hot hues black that we're laying down on top gives us the bold two-tone we want, and breaking the color below the style line keeps the graphic off the hood, making it a simple but very effective layout. After the break, we're burning down the tech center, spraying more flames than a flamethrower. Stick around. Hey, welcome back. While HRT is in the booth getting a fresh coat of custom paint, I'm in here putting some finishing touches on the chassis and drivetrain. Now with our headers on, I went ahead and installed the shift linkage so we can measure for exhaust clearance and figure out how the heck we're going to get the exhaust tubing to the back of the truck. Hey, what do you think? Pretty cool, huh? Well, if you think this looks cool, just wait till you see what's coming. Now, you saw us lay down both of these colors before the break, but what I did is come back with a 6222 protective clear coat to act as a barrier between our ground coat and our custom work. That way, if we decide to change our mind or make a mistake and have to do a repair, we don't interfere with our two ground coat colors. Armed with our rendering as a guide, we still have the freedom of laying out flames that look good on the vehicle and not just on paper. Quarter inch fine line tape gives us a nice bold line to visualize and is easy to turn corners with. All three of us have laid out flames before, but being able to work together without ego and work off each other's talent made the job a lot easier. 
With a collective effort and a few adult beverages, we settle on this design. Everybody's happy with it, so now it's just a matter of transferring this over to the other side, and there's an easy way to do that. Using the two-tone brake as a guide, we're using the time-tested method of tracing the graphic onto paper using a pencil, perforating it on the floor with a pinwheel that punches tiny holes in the paper, tape the trace side of the perforated paper towards the panels on the other side, and using a pounce pad filled with drywall chalk. And what you'll end up with is a perfect mirror image of the driver's side to lay your tape on. For masking, we're using Frisk film, which is basically wide, clear plastic masking tape to mask the flames off. The rest of the truck gets masked off to protect it from overspray. Which gets us ready to lay down a ground coat of white that'll start our color fade and really make the other colors pop. We're using an LPH-80 from Iwata to lay down the larger colors. These guns allow maximum coverage without a lot of buildup, so our graphic won't be hard to bury in clear later. The next color is Sunkiss Orange, which is yellow, and is faded from the white and carried back almost to the end of the flame legs. Next is red, and it gets loaded into an Iwata Highline TH, which is an airbrush with a trigger, so you get the trigger control you're familiar with as well as the precision of an airbrush. Tommy's mixed red and yellow to get an orange color to fade into. And since all the hot hues base colors have no hardener, they're safe to use with a charcoal mask. With flame licks to cross over or under each other, just use masking tape to mask the direction, and then spray against the tape to give it a two-dimensional look. Amazing grape goes on the tips of the licks, and we're using a Micron Plus from Iwata for a bit finer detail. With the white ground coat, it takes very little color to cover, and we get the effect we want fast. Even the most experienced airbrush artists use two hands to steady the brush. This just gives you maximum control over your work. With the colors laid out and checked by the peanut gallery, the masking comes off and we get the first glimpse of what the finished product will look like. With the graphic laid out, the body comes apart for the door jams and backsides to be painted. The parts get cleaned and the graphic gets masked for protection. Following the graphic into the door jams is one thing that separates a regular paint job from a true custom job. The time investment is huge, but the payoff is work that's on par with the big boys. The fine line tape creates a nice clean edge to the graphic. Then we'll take and back tape this. When we fill this in with red, peel this off, it's a nice finished edge. When we come back, we're putting the puzzle back together for the last time. You don't want to miss this. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. As you can see, HRT is finally under paint and ready to go back together. And since we can't possibly show you in real time all the hours that it took to get us finished up, well, these are the basic steps. Once the jams were painted, and after the first two coats of clear were sanded flat with 600 grit, Muscle Car's Rick Bacon was nice enough to pull some lines for us and outline the flames, and the Midori Sour Green accent stripe as well. As a final touch, we followed that with a candy purple drop shadow to give us a 2D effect and lift the flames off the panel. Then everything was buried in another four coats of Hot Hues 5100 Hot Clear and Four Stride. After a ton of sanding and buffing every single painted surface, the bottom of the cab as well as the fenders and running boards were coated in Duplicolor bed liner for some added protection. If you're doing a paint job this elaborate, it's worth a couple of six packs to get your buddies to help put it back together. Carefully. Just don't crack the drinks open until you're all done. Well, here it is. Finally, after hundreds of hours of labor, 
thousands of dollars worth of filler, primer, sandpaper, paint, and polish. Yeah, not to mention quite a few bucks worth of parts thrown in. This is Project HRT. Now this truck is not the work of just one guy. There are plenty of people that have poured their heart into making this truck a stunning one-of-a-kind hot rod. Tommy Boschers has 100 hours into blocking alone, and Ryan and I, well, we've got tons of time invested as well. Very few high-end street rods are the product of just one person, and HRT is the result of some great and talented people jumping on board to make this the coolest truck ever to come out of our shop. And now that you've finally gotten to see what our vision has been for this truck, everything that follows, the interior and all the finishing touches, are going to be just as cool as the paint. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Now, unless you've been under a rock for about the last year, you know that we're giving away Project HRT. This 37 Ford pickup is all street rod with the best of the best in the aftermarket, right down to the cool flame paint job. And it's not quite finished yet, but it's closer every day. So that brings us here to a quiet, unassuming corner in Shelbyville, Tennessee, to what very well may be one of Tennessee's best kept secrets, B&B Auto Trim. So come with us while me and Tommy check out what's inside. Michael Young of Street Rods by Michael introduced us to these guys. B&B Auto Trim has been doing quality custom interiors since the 1950s. Over the years, they've been building a very impressive resume of completed vehicles. Now, don't let the name fool you, because these guys will upholster just about anything that'll stand still long enough, like this Jabiru aircraft that's manufactured in Australia, but assembled here in the United States. B&B throws an interior in about one of these a week. Steve Gifford, B&B's head designer, is a hands-on leader, working right alongside his guys, overseeing every project that comes out of the shop. Steve uses his years of skill, as well as a keen sense of styling, to anticipate new trends in the market, giving B&B's customers every possible option. It used to be tweeds, everyone with the hot rods. Now suede, leathers, and the exotic materials now are just really hot. B&B takes their design cues from a mix of what the vehicle demands and what the customer wants. With Project HRT, we wanted it to be elegant and classic at the same time. The chrome and the black, you know, the leather and the suede just gives you a luxury feel on the inside that you have something that's high dollar on the inside as well as it's definitely sporty. Man, would you take a look at this. This interior is outstanding. There's three different types of fabric, carpet, a custom overhead console with dome lights, hidden speakers in the corners, completely reupholstered seats, a center console, and everything is wrapped around the custom chrome-plated fiberglass dash from Advanced Plating. We gotta get this thing back to the shop, show you guys a closer look. So we loaded up HRT and thanked B&B for their incredible workmanship and headed back to the shop. Oh, and by the way, you can find B&B Auto Trim by going to the truck's website. You won't be disappointed. Man, that thing looks killer. Man, those guys at B&B really hit one out of the park. Check out the details. The leather accents on the chrome dash, rewrapped steering wheel, custom-made center console, and the six-way power seats borrowed from a late model Pontiac, it all looks like it was made for this truck. And that's the result of experience and a sense of style and design. Custom speaker grills, an overhead console with chrome accents, a plush padded insert that houses our auto meter gauges, even the storage compartments behind the seats show B&B's incredible attention to detail and function. Of course, the chromed wraparound dash from Advanced Plating and Watson Streetworks billet flame door latches just add to the whole appeal of this interior. The combination of all these components is exactly what we had hoped for. 
Today, we'll show you all the work that's gone into Project HRT and a few of the little details still left to go. Then, one of the very best metal crafters ever, Ron Covell, stops by the shop to teach us how to make a handmade and very unique air intake for our hot rod truck. It's all today, here on Trucks. Hey, thanks for watching Trucks, and thanks for sticking with us on the show. Well, it's been a jam-packed year with tons of cool projects, and most of them have been finished and paid off big time. But there's a couple that haven't quite been finished up yet, like our sectioned 66 Chevy C10. But don't worry, you guys will see that thing again soon enough, and when you do, well, it'll be road ready. And then there's this thing, our 37 Ford Project HRT. Now we're going over this thing, making sure every nut and bolt is tight and that it performs flawlessly for whoever wins it. But we've also got one more new project for this truck, and one that's going to give it a lot more personality and peg the cool meter with some handcrafted automotive jewelry. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. And we're also going to remind you guys how this truck got to where it is from where it started. If you remember, we started out with a fiberglass body on a box frame, rolling on giant Mickey Thompson wheels and tires. But that's about all it did. And as good as it looked, it was a long way from a driver. After we had the front end dialed in and the drive line in place, the body work was next. And as straight as the gel coat was, it still was not up to the standard we wanted to set with this build. So the time consuming process of blocking, filling seams, gapping the doors, and final fitting all of the panels was drawn out over several weeks. Now that bodywork kept all three of us plenty busy, but it's no secret that we had lots of good help along the way, because these frame rails, well, they didn't get looking that smooth on their own. Bay One Customs stepped up and offered to smooth and finish the frame for us while we had some other stuff going on. And what they gave back to us was quality craftsmanship. Smoothed welds, blocked primer, and perfect semi-gloss paint were now the foundation of this hot rod truck. And that fit perfectly with the plans that we had for paint and body prep. And that meant priming and blocking and priming and blocking and blocking and blocking and fitting until the body was mocked up. Fit perfectly and it was finally ready for a new coat of paint. Now we're all proud of this paint job. And you guys know that that doesn't just happen by accident. And the paint doesn't just fall out of the gun. But one of the things we were able to do is show you some insight into what it takes to plan a paint job like this and to execute it afterwards. Before the first drop of paint was in the cup, we sat down for a planning session. And me, Tommy, Ryan, and Steve Longacre tossed around some ideas on form, proportion, okay. colors, and designs. And with Steve's talents as a graphic artist, we ended up with a killer rendering to go by for the layout of the paint. With a plan to go by, the red and black base colors were laid down. And Brian Bodker from Car Crafter Customs helped us lay down the flames. We used the time-tested method of tracing using a pounce pad to transfer a mirror image of the flames onto the other side, and then shaded in the traditional flame colors. Rick Bacon from Muscle Car outlined the fire, and after a drop shadow was added to the flame licks, everything was buried in clear coat, and then cut and rubbed to a glass-like finish. Now, we've managed to keep the screwdrivers, belt buckles, and jack handles out of the paint so far, but there's still a ton of work to do before we give this thing away. And even with all this pretty paint on it, well, it was still a hollow shell of a truck, so it was time to pay attention to the interior and it needed to be outstanding. We had already spent some time picking out a seat style, no way. <laughs> and sadly, the armchair lost out. But once we decided on a comfortable design that fit the truck, we focused on driver controls and layout. And then we carried the whole truck over to B&B Auto Trim. Steve Gifford and his crew started with the layer of insulation from DEI to make sure the road noise was held to a minimum. Then the process of making the headliner, and trim panels was started, followed by the custom center console, door panels, recovered seats from a 90s vintage Pontiac, some cool accents and detail, followed by several cows worth of hides stitched together to finish it off. The centerpiece to any interior is the dash, and this truck already had a cool design. So with our gauges laid out, 
Steve and the guys over at Advanced Plating chromed the wraparound fiberglass dash and door trim for a seriously cool look. A lot of time and energy was put into this truck, and we thank everybody at B&B for their hard work. Man, they did a good job. Up next, details, 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 and we've got plenty of them. And later, Ron Covell's in the kitchen cooking up something inspired by this hot rod. Stick around. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Today, we're giving you a little insight on all the progress that's been made on Project HRT in between the shows you've seen like the brake system. Tommy bent up some 3 16 stainless steel brake line, held everything in place using these T-clamps from Made For You. Then we sent it through the frame rail utilizing Russell fittings. Now, if you guys are doing this kind of work at home, make sure you use steel fittings, not aluminum. It just won't hold up to the extreme pressures of a hydraulic brake system. Then, to finish things off, we installed these color matched Crown Flex lines. Now, to keep this thing from running hot, we're using the all-aluminum radiator from Be Cool Incorporated. For hoses, we're using the Earl's Formaflex with the chrome ends. Now, it doesn't matter how much measuring, test fitting, or mocking up that you do on a build, there's always going to be stuff that has to be adjusted after reassembly. For instance, take a look at our running board here. There's not enough tire clearance. This doesn't allow any lateral movement in the axle or tire swell, but it's okay because we can trim along the line that I've marked. This is a thick running board, and our fender edge starts right here, so we got lots of room. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it takes a long time to debug a vehicle, so in the immortal words of my good friend Randy Estes, it ain't messed up till you can't fix it anymore. Now on a truck this nice, we wanted to make sure it was still a driver, and part of that is making sure the driver and passenger are comfortable. So we're installing a Vintage Air Compact Gen 2 system. It tucks nicely up behind our chrome dash and should handle climate control, no sweat. Get it? No sweat. For fuel delivery, we're using 3 8 inch braided stainless fuel line and is connected at the top of the rail with more T-clamps to keep it away from anything that moves nice and safe. And it's feeding an Edelbrock electric fuel pump that's internally regulated. There's a filter behind the carburetor. And since this is a carbureted application, it's nice and clean since we don't have a reason for a return line. At the tank, we're using a Dash 6 stainless connection. Yeah, and if you guys ever wonder what the Dash 6 and Dash 12, all those numbers mean, well, it was a system developed by the U.S. military based on sixteenths of an inch. So if you've got a half inch, well, that's eight sixteenths, a Dash 8 line. If you've got a quarter inch, well, it's four sixteenths, so you've got a Dash 4. It's really kind of simple. Now, we didn't have a whole lot of room to work with as far as a fuel tank, so we took some careful measurements and sent them over to Rick and Hector at Rick's Hot Rod Shop, and they crafted up this great-looking stainless steel tank. It's fully baffled, has a nice brushed finish, and comes with a fuel-level sender. Now, to get some gas in this thing, but we'll have to do like we did on Project Old School and put a fuel filler in the bed floor. Now, as good as these Optima batteries look, this thing is not going under the hood. It's too clean in there, and there's not enough room. So with a street rod, you've got to get creative. And we found some free real estate back here behind the fender. The wheel's not going to come in contact with it. So we talked to our buddies at Blue Torch Fab, and they sent us a battery box that's specifically designed to house an Optima battery. With the nitro plate coating we had put on it, it should stay nice looking and rust free as long as this guy owns this truck. Now, to separate this truck from a lot of the other hot rods out there, we wanted to run a manual transmission, a six-speed, but we didn't want a hard-to-depress clutch pedal, so we ended up going with a complete hydraulic setup from a cloud. Like Kevin was talking about with the battery, we didn't want a bunch of stuff in the engine bay or on the firewall cluttering up the nice, clean look, so we've got everything mounted down here on the frame rail where it's hidden and out of the way. Now, this truck is really starting to come together, but like we said, there's one more project that we're going to do that's really going to make this engine bay pop, and it's going to be handmade by a master craftsman, and it's going to happen right before your eyes, so stick around. When we come back, it's metal forming, taught by the master. Stay tuned.
Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Well, with Project HRT on the home stretch, we wanted to do one more thing to dress it up under the hood. We heard our good buddy Ron Coval is here in the area presenting a workshop at Metalcraft Tools, so we dragged him over here to help. Now, those of you who've studied welding or metal fab, well, you probably know Ron as Professor Hammer from his magazine columns. Now, Ron's been working with metal for more than 40 years, and he presents workshops all over the world. That's right, Kevin. Every year I cross the country from coast to coast, presenting workshops primarily on sheet metal fabrication. I cover both aluminum and steel, and the workshops are open to both the beginning and advanced students. Now, not only does Ron put on his workshops, he's got a full line of instructional DVDs covering many aspects of metalworking and welding. That's right, Ryan. For those who can't come to a workshop, I've made 23 DVDs that cover a wide range of metalworking processes. It's like having a workshop at home. And believe it or not, Ron has a master's degree in metal sculpture, and the project he's got for us today is pretty darn cool. What we're going to sculpt today is an air cleaner, and we'll start with the base plate. So I've made a form from medium density fiberboard. The form has the contoured edge that we want the base of the scoop to have. We're working with aluminum. This is 1 16th of an inch thick, and I'm going to soften this metal by annealing to make it easier to work. Annealing is done with an acetylene torch in two steps. The first step is applying the soot, which becomes a temperature indicator. Step two is burning off the soot, and when the soot is gone, you know the metal is fully annealed. That means the friction is changed and lowered between the grains of metal, relieving internal stress, making it softer. We're using pins to keep the parts aligned while hammering, and using the vise to hold the form tight against the metal. Hammer forming allows us to create a curved edge around the base while keeping the center flat. With the base formed, it's time to shape the sides, this time by hand using the base as a reference. These pieces have previously been annealed so they're nice and soft and easy to work with. The sides can now be tack welded to the base. Ron's TIG welding with aluminum rod. The rod he's using is 1 16th inch diameter 1100 rod, which is pure aluminum. To give the scoop its dome shape on the top, Ron's using an English wheel from Metalcraft. The metal gets rolled between the upper and lower wheel, stretching it and doming it. Ron's chosen a lower wheel with the same crown that the top piece needs. One edge of each top piece gets peaked using a T-dolly mounted in the vise and a slap hammer. With the top halves formed and checked, you can start to see the design emerge as they get tacked together. After the break, Ron will finish up our custom intake for Project HRT. Don't go away. Hey, thanks for watching Trucks, as we get a hands-on lesson from Ron Covell with our final HRT project. So there's two more pieces left to complete our air cleaner, and those are the air intake or nostrils, and they look just like this. And they're made using another type of a hammer form, this time a metal one. The nostrils are made with a different hammer form, this time with the flat stock sandwiched in between the wood and metal forms, using pins for alignment. With the fixture mounted in the vise, Ron uses a wooden drift to fold the edges flat against the internal metal form. For the corners, he uses a rounded dowel to shape the flange. Hammering gently gives him the control he needs so the soft aluminum doesn't split. Now with your workpiece shaped and out of the hammer form, here's a cool tip. You can use quarter inch fine line tape to get a perfect half inch and quarter inch outside dimension for your final cut. When it's cut, your finished piece looks exactly like this. The nostrils are tack welded together at an angle that matches the front of the scoop. And I made a template that shows the contour it needs to be shaped to. This is a homemade fixture made from scrap pieces of metal. Any of you could make a project like this and it's perfect for giving a curved shape to the opening of the nostrils. I think I'm done. With everything tacked together to form the basic shape, now it can be finish welded with the same aluminum rod. TIG welding aluminum takes a lot of finesse, but Ron's had a bit of practice and lays down a flawless bead. 
Once the seams are welded, they get metal finished, first with a grinder. Then they can be filed or sanded, depending on the type of finish that you want. So with a couple more hours of cleanup work, this is what we've got. So let's slip this into place, and there you go. Man, this looks fantastic, Ron. And if this looks familiar to some of you guys out there, there's a reason for that. Take a look at this. This is Greer Black and Prudhomme's famous 1962 front engine dragster with its distinctive air scoop made by Wayne Ewing. And this car is the inspiration for our handcrafted piece. Ron, thanks so much for spending some time with us today and showing our viewers some excellent tips on working with aluminum. Thank you, Kevin. I've had a ball with this project and I really appreciate your help with it. Well, it's gonna be a nice finishing touch for Project HRT. But I've got this car at home in the shop. I wanted to do a molded in hood scoop.